Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second session on computational tools for sustainability. This one focused on spatiotemporal impacts in sustainability and resiliency analyses. So a lot of really complicated in-depth modeling and analysis efforts that we're very excited to hear about. Uh, first up, we have uh, Garrett Cole, a research associate at Colorado State University. Take it away, Garrett. Hi, uh, my name's Garrett. Uh, today, I'm really gonna touch on uh, some of the modeling work that went into my uh, recent master's thesis, uh, with a particular focus on some of these spatial temp and temporal impacts in uh, sustainability with uh, produced water treatment. Um, so first, wanna you know, thank the DOE for uh, funding my master's degree, uh, as well as uh, uh, NREL and NAWI for uh, really being the proving grounds in which this work was developed. Um, so first, want uh, to- Excuse me, sorry, Garrett. Um, could you go into presentation mode and or your slides might have frozen? Um, maybe try unsharing and resharing. Is this looking right? Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, so first, yeah, provide a brief overview of uh, what produced water is, uh, for those of you unfamiliar, and then specifically look at some of the uh, temporal implications associated with trying to model it, and how I've accounted for those in my methods. Of course, we'll end with uh, um, some results and, and look at how that affects uh, my modeling work. Uh, so first, what is produced water? Um, to do that, let's look at a, a particular oil well here. Um, so you might guess where I'm going. Uh, produced water manifests at oil and gas wells. It is, it, it really has two parts. It is first trapped in the shale with the oil and gas. Um, and it's uh, also uh, made up of some water that is injected when uh, hydraulic fracturing is implemented. And produced water, um, Generally, all you really need to know for this presentation is it's dirty, can't drink it, it's bad for the environment, has lots of contaminants, uh, very high salinity, and so uh, we have to do something with it. Uh, generally, uh, what we do with it now is we truck it, uh, can be long distances to EPA uh, injection wells where we just stuff it back underground. Uh, there are some problems with this though. Um, first, it's a, it's a waste of a valuable resource there are also some potential issues with induced seismic activity, and there's uh, you know, greater potential for contamination when traveling longer distances. So one of the alternatives to try and keep this water within the water cycle is to desalinate it and then uh, um, discharge to uh, a stream or the surface for uh, later reuse. Uh, there are two alternatives when you're looking at surface discharge. Uh, we're looking at uh, desalination specifically, and you can either do that on site or at a centralized location. Uh, literature to date has really identified on site as being uh, optimal, and that's uh, because of the reduced transportation distances and those costs associated with uh, those reduced distances. However, there are some uh, um, there are some aspects of on site desalination that have pre previously neglected. And so I want to look at some actual data from this well pad we've been looking at to kind of identify uh, what's missing right now. Uh, first thing you'll notice is this, uh, the flow rate is um, varies dramatically with time. So over the first six months or so of operation, you get a, a dramatic decay in the flow rate. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna introduce uh, an economic term to uh, try and highlight some of the problems here. Um, so, you know, first, if I'm going to desalinate at this well, I might implement a desalination unit of a design capacity, a chosen design capacity. Uh, the obvious choice would be to desalinate at the average capacity, which here is 25 meters cubed per day. Uh, the problem is we have all of this flow in the first nine months of operation that is significantly above this design capacity. So we have to store it. Uh, to store the, that much water uh, requires a storage tank about the size of half a football field and the height of like a two to three story building. So that's not very feasible. Um, the other option would be to increase our design capacity uh, so that we need no storage of water. Uh, the problem here, again, I'm gonna introduce this uh, economic modeling term 
Um, the problem here is we're operating far below the design capacity. And so uh, we look at this ratio of the volume of water treated to the total uh, volume of water that could be treated at the design capacity. And we call that our capacity factor. Um, so this is used to, uh, in, in, in techno-economic modeling, we'll come back to it in my methods. Um, so speaking of methods, um, you know, take, um, no, we'll get there. Um, so first, we're going to look at the data uh, that we collected uh, for this model. So right now, you're looking at a map of uh, Weld County, Colorado. There are about 5,000 wells plotted uh, in this space. And for each of these wells, uh, these are also our injection wells. Uh, but for each of these wells, uh, we pulled data with a monthly resolution. So looking at these immediately, you can see some of the uh, both uh, spatio um, parameters and, and the differences between these wells and also uh, uh, some temporal variation. Uh, so draw your attention to the uh, well in orange here first. So it's a very young well. And also that means that there is a, as I mentioned earlier, a, a decay in flow rate very early in its life. Uh, well B, um, you notice it's almost you know uh, at four four years old at the beginning of this study period. So it's got a much lower flow rate and a much uh, steadier flow rate. And so that creates some problems in trying to uh, maintain this network of on-site treatment units at uh, high capacity factors. Um, uh, we also were able to pull data uh, for the transportation distances, unique transportation distances from each well to its uh, respective injection site. Um, so all that data goes into an economic model. I don't really have time to go over the entire economic model, so I just want to focus on the uh, the impact of capacity factor. And so when we're looking at treating or desalinating this water, uh, we're really attributing you know a treatment cost to a, a meter cubed of water. And uh, how do you, how exactly do you do that when you have this one time expense uh, that is buying the capital equipment? Um, draw your attention to pumps A and B as an example. Uh, you see the pump A. Uh, moves a lot more water uh, over its lifetime. And so you can uh, distribute the cost of that capital equipment over a larger volume of water. Um, thus, it actually costs less to move any single meter cubed of water. And so that's what we use capacity factor for in the techno-economic analysis is to look at uh, the volume of water that can be treated um, the higher the capacity factor, the more water you can treat during your lifetime, and the cheaper that the results, uh, the treatment cost can be. Um, so we'll take our economic model, and that's going to interface with the uh, multi-objective optimization. Um, um, so multi-objective optimization is great because we've got these decision variables, um, and we'll be able to really look at which variables are optimal and um, how that impacts our, our some different objectives. So the decision variables I'm looking at are the desalination technology, the um, treatment capacity of an individual unit. We've talked about how that has implications already. Uh, the number of treatment units deployed could be one, two, three, or a couple thousand, and the uh, uh, planning horizon. That planning horizon is defined as the length of time that an operator will look into the future uh, when deploying these mobile uh, on-site treatment units. Um, and so we use these decision variables and we take our economic model and we look at, uh, we use our economic model um, to, to come up with this degree of profitability given our uh, decision variables. So this, uh, what I'm calling this degree of profitability is really the money saved um, versus the, uh, the money spent. So the money saved is the injection cost savings and transportation cost savings, uh, ICS and TCS respectively. And the money spent is the operational and capital um, expenditures uh, involved in deploying uh, desalination units. And so um, during each planning period, which I'm defining with a planning horizon, there is a potential to uh, redeploy all of our desalination units. And in my model, I'm using this degree of profitability 
to determine the locations for which an operator uh, might choose to place uh, treatment units during each of uh, planning horizon. So the higher the degree of profitability, um, we'll place those units in those locations first. Um, so we take, like I mentioned earlier, we take those decision variables and we um, have some objective functions and we uh, use the objective functions to map our, uh, our points in decision space to objective space. Uh, so each point in decision space is made up of a unique combination of uh, decision variables. There are 720 of them in our model. Um, and so, like I said, we map each of those to objective space. Um, in objective space, we can uh, look at, you know, a few things. Uh, first, we're trying to minimize our objective one. For us, that's going to be treatment cost. We're trying to maximize objective two, uh, which for us is going to be reuse. And then we can classify each of these solutions um, as either dominated in that um, both objectives can be improved simultaneously or Pareto optimal, um, meaning that in order to improve one solution, uh, it's going to hurt. In order to prove one objective, it's going to be proved detrimental to another objective. Um, so if we connect all of our Pareto optimal solutions, we get the Pareto frontier. And so the real beauty of uh, multi-objective optimization is to um, be able to look at a range of equally optimal solutions um, and quantify uh, for a decision maker to choose on their own how um, important either reuse or cost are to them. All right. Um, so that was our, you know, objective space. So let's let's look at our actual objective space. Again, we have, you know, treatment cost minimized, reuse maximized, and let's put some actual points on this from the the real data. And we go ahead and add in, you know, some different desalination technologies. Uh, you've got a wide spread of costs. I'm going to zoom in here. Uh, when I zoom in, I can highlight those Pareto optimal solutions that I had mentioned previously, and. Um, you can see that uh, you know, treatment cost lies between uh, $5 and $9 per meter cubed. Uh, you can compare that to the gray dashed line, which is the business as usual cost uh, associated with what we normally do, injection uh, in Wells County. And we can see that uh, a lot of those are uh, better, cheaper solutions um, than the business as usual. Uh, but I want to point out a few things here. Um, and so to do that, um, I'm now going to cluster each of these lines. I'm going to uh, designate our technologies by their uh, treatment capacity and the planning horizon. Because uh, there, there's a, a correlation really between um, those clusters uh, and the uh, cost versus reuse. Um, so here, the dashed line represents smaller the dash represents a smaller planning horizon. The bigger the line represents a bigger capacity. And you'll be able to note a few things. Uh, first, that all these solutions on the Pareto frontier all have a capacity of 100 meters cubed per day, and that they all utilize a one month planning horizon. Um, so why is that? Uh, trying to address you know, some of those things real quick. Um, these really have to do with some of the temporal aspects. Um, so if you look at this graph here, we have a capacity factor on the vertical axis and water reuse on the horizontal axis. Um, so I mentioned earlier, you know, what capacity factor is and why it is important to maximize capacity factor. Uh, but you'll notice the capacity factor tails off as water reuse increases. Um, that's because we've got to treat more water and we're uh, implementing desalination at locations where the design capacity is often greater than the water available. Um, so one way to uh, increase capacity factor is just to decrease our uh, treatment capacity. Uh, which you see here, uh, the smaller the capacities have higher capacity factors. Uh, but that introduces a trade-off between decreasing economies of scale and uh, increasing capacity factor. And so that's how you wind up with this optimal uh, mid-size range I pointed out earlier of 100 meters cubed per day. You'll notice this affects magnified at higher levels of reuse. Uh, so let's look at the maximum level of reuse in a new graph here. Uh, again, capacity factor is on the vertical axis, uh, but this time I've put relocation cost on the horizontal axis. 
Um, so another thing to keep in mind uh, is that uh, when you decrease the treatment capacity, you're not only uh, reducing economies of scale, you're also inherently increasing the amounts of modules you have to move. Uh, to have the same total treatment capacity. If you have smaller treatment units, you got to have more treatment units. Uh, so there's also this uh, trade-off between increasing relocations and relocation cost versus increasing this capacity factor. Um, so that's another uh, reason why this uh, 100 meter cube per day capacity uh, was optimal when you're looking at objective space. And Garrett, sorry to interrupt, but we are um, at 15 minutes. So can you wrap it up maybe in the next yep. uh, 30 to 45 seconds so we have time for a couple questions? Yep, this is my last slide. Um, Thank you. <laughs> just wanted to uh, address why this one month planning horizon is also optimal. Uh, we can do that looking at the exact same plot. Uh, now I've just added uh, all of the um, different planning horizons. Uh, you'll notice that the shorter the planning horizon is, uh, that involves uh, relocating units more frequently because you've got a shorter planning horizon. And so again, uh, relocating units, keeping them in optimal locations allows you to increase capacity factor, uh, but at the cost of increased location. Um, so that's why that one month planning horizon exists. Uh, really in conclusion, um, you gotta make you got to keep uh, careful consideration of these packaged plant sizes and uh, consideration of their deployment lengths to um, um, really account for this variable capacity factor, uh, which has been previously neglected in this research. I'll go ahead and open to questions. All right. Thank you very much, Garrett. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat at the moment, um, but I kind of have a question because I, I have struggled with multi-objective optimization in the past and it's, it's always fun. Um, I'm curious about the trade-offs that you were seeing um, in your results. Are these uh, more or less what you were expecting or uh, are, were they a little stronger than you were expecting? Yeah, so they are a little stronger than I was expecting, uh, which really goes into some future work stuff uh, that I might work on. Well, so first, my model, my model assumes that um, when I when my uh, decision variable is 100 meters cube per day capacity, it means that every treatment unit is 100 meters cube per day. So if we're looking at this plot again, we can treat up to 200 meters cube per day capacity. But what happens to this extra little water at the top? Well, right now we have to place another 100 meter cube per day capacity unit or inject it. Um, another option I think would be to either buy some storage to store that water or to put a smaller treatment capacity in there, uh, which I just don't have the modeling capabilities for at the moment. Uh, but I believe that would be optimal sometimes and it would um, reduce the dr how dramatic uh, the capacity factor drops off when you get to higher and higher levels of reuse. Makes sense. All right, we have um, one more question in the chat. Um, unfortunately, we. We're on such a tight timeline, I'm not sure that we can address it right now, but um, Kai, if you want to follow up with Garrett uh, afterwards or even maybe low key in the green room, <laughs> that would be that would be great. Um, but let us move on to our next presenter, uh, Professor Samuel, Mar Samuel Markoff uh, from the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of California, Merced. All right, okay. mic check. You're good. Okay, screen share check. Okay, are you seeing in presenter mode? Or yeah, sorry, the full? Good. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone, and thank you for sticking it out to the uh, last session. I'm excited to be here to share some early stage work that seeks to gain a better understanding of the movement of people and goods between cities especially in the context of extreme events and possible uh, resilience strategies for dealing with those extreme events. To motivate this uh, a little bit before kind of digging into the, to the details, uh, between things like aging and under-maintained infrastructure, uh, increasing demand, extreme weather and climate change, our transportation systems are faced with a variety of threats that unfortunately make the events depicted here far too common of an occurrence. 
Uh, and given the immediate safety concerns associated with these types of events and the broader impacts they have on our ability to access critical goods and services, uh, this work at its highest level is motivated by the desire to better understand these types of events and more importantly, help inform decision making that can minimize their occurrence and impacts. So before digging into our methods and preliminary results, I want to first spend a little bit of time grounding this work in the context of broader resilience theory and practice. Um, so I'm sure kind of many of you have seen uh, a definition like this for resilience or a similar definition. So the ability to plan and prepare for, absorb, recover from, and adapt to adverse events. You've probably also seen some version of this graph, which is often referred to as a critical functionality curve, uh, which kind of shows these different steps of resilience playing out for a particular uh, infrastructure system or service delivery. Um, so for the purposes of our, our talk, I'll kind of, I'll phrase this as the traditional uh, perspective on engineering resilience. Um, and this often provides us with a, a good foundation and a good framework from which to move forward with various resilience objectives. Um, however, there are a couple of shortcomings uh, associated with this traditional approach. Um, one in particular is that uh, a failure kind of has to occur before you can really evaluate the system's ability to do these Thing. So to the system's ability to prepare or absorb or recover from uh, a particular event. So it, it it's it's kind of a it sets up kind of a high stakes environment in which you kind of have to cross your fingers, for lack of a better term, that the steps in the planning and preparation that you've done before the event are sufficient to uh, increase your ability to absorb and recover from the event once it happens. So. Um, and the, the second kind of shortcoming is that the, per, this perspective uh, doesn't necessarily say too much about how do you enhance your ability to absorb or recover or adapt from uh, various events. And so um, folks have been looking at this problem and, and kind of uh, working to expand on this traditional uh, perspective on resilience and, and uh, a variety of additional approaches and concepts have been developed and proposed uh, to supplement and enhance this traditional perspective of resilience. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go through these approaches and concepts in a lot of detail, but um, in general, they make a couple of key advancements. One, they position resilience as an active process rather than a static characteristic of the system. So uh, they start kind of viewing resilience as a continual iterative process rather than in the traditional perspective, resilience is often viewed as kind of a, almost a binary, you have it or you don't characteristic of your system. Uh, so now we're kind of moving more towards that active framing, active thinking. And then the second key kind of advancement is um, these kind of, uh, these approaches introduce and develop various capacities and regimes of resilience that can enhance this active process. So introducing concepts like uh, flexibility and agility, uh, thinking of resilience as a combination of rebound, robustness, extensibility. Uh, I don't mean to kind of throw a bunch of words at you, but um, uh, but uh, the idea here again is that just it's it's thinking of resilience as more of an active uh, process rather than kind of a, a static uh, condition of your system. Um, however, despite these advancements uh, that that these approaches bring to the traditional perspective of resilience. Challenges still remain with respect to taking action before a disruption occurs. So uh, again, if you're, if you're looking at the SOL framework that's kind of shown at the top there, uh, SOL short for sensing, anticipating, adapting, and learning. Um, even though it is kind of a continual and iterative process, the adapting and learning are still kind of highly dependent uh, and informed by a disruption occurring. So you're still kind of facing some of the same issues that I mentioned earlier. Uh, additionally, it can sometimes be a challenge to know how best to balance and navigate efforts related to rebound, robustness, extensibility. So when and where should you focus more on rebound efforts versus robustness efforts versus extensibility? Um, 
and so given this context, uh, we are developing a modeling and analysis approach that facilitates the exploration and comparison of different disruption and resilience scenarios with the ultimate goal of enabling more proactive uh, actions and decisions. So again, trying to move from being reactive to being more proactive. Uh, and in particular, the approach that we're developing uh, appears to be particularly well suited for aiding the anticipating portion uh, of the solve framework and to a lesser extent, the uh, adapting and learning stages of the solve framework, uh, as well as allowing for consistent and quantitative comparison of different resilience regimes, such as rebound and robustness. And prior to this, doing that type of comparison, especially a quantitative comparison of those different regimes uh, has, has been uh, a little bit of a challenge. So we kind of highlight here in the gold, you can see the kind of core areas where uh, we feel our, our modeling uh, environment and our approach is particularly well suited to uh, kind of advancing the state of knowledge and practice. Uh, so that takes us kind of into uh, our, our actual model and, and methods. Um, and in particular, we focus on uh, inner city, trying to model inner city traffic conditions uh, in the southwestern United States. Um, the, the reason we kind of take this uh, scope or this perspective is uh, for a few different uh, uh, purposes. For one, inner city highways are oft, uh, often do not have as much kind of natural or built in redundancy to the network as uh, an urban transportation system might have. So you can kind of see the effects of that in these um, in these kind of short videos here, uh, where this is an event that happened in 2017 on I-17 between Phoenix and Flagstaff. Uh, there was a big wreck and it ultimately resulted in a five mile long backup of traffic. Uh, and that's pre predominantly due to the fact that there just there was nowhere else for the cars to go. They were kind of in this critical choke point along the along the corridor. That uh, once the wreck happened, they were kind of stuck there until the uh, uh, till the uh, response crews could come and clear the wreck. Um, and so that kind of highlights a key a key feature of these inner city uh, traffic networks and routes that. Uh, we, we feel warrants further uh, exploration and development. Um, and then also despite their import, importance as freight corridors, uh, inner city highways are not nearly as explored or analyzed as urban traffic systems. There's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, 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 kind of data availability being one of them, there's, there's a lot more data uh, and need for data in urban areas than, than say there maybe would be in these kind of more uh, uh, rural or intercity corridors. Um, and, and this lack of data and analysis is especially true in the context of extreme events, disruptions, and resilience. So um, that's kind of the underlying reasoning for us, at least initially focusing on this region. Uh, and one, trying to model the baseline kind of day-to-day, -day, minute by minute traffic conditions that are happening between the major cities in the southwestern United States. So El Paso, Tucson, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Uh, and then once the baseline is modeled, uh, develop and explore various disruption and resilience scenarios to sort of uh, do that type of comparison that I outlined in the in the previous slides. Um, so we're using the Southwest United States as a starting point, and we develop an agent-based traffic model for stimulating passenger and freight movement between major cities in the region under these baseline and disrupted conditions. Uh, I won't go super deep into the, the model itself, uh, and I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A or, or offline, but uh, this provides kind of a general overall schematic of, of kind of the key inputs uh, and, and analysis that goes into the model. Um, so just to kind of highlight a few of the key uh, data points, uh, traffic data comes from sources like the freight analysis framework and state departments of transportation. The road network data comes from open street maps. The hazard data that we use to identify the types of hazards that may cause a disruption, and more importantly, the location where those disruptions could potentially happen 
uh, come from existing tools and resources such as the My Hazards tool developed by the Arizona Geological Survey. Um, and so ultimately, we combine the traffic data with the road network data. Uh, uh, th those are integrated together to form the baseline traffic simulations. And then disruption scenarios are uh, explored uh, using the hazard tools that, that I mentioned. So to kind of start looking at some of our preliminary results, what we can see here is um, kind of an illustration of our baseline model, uh, baseline traffic conditions, and some kind of high level statistics, just kind of summarizing uh, everything. So on average for all of the agents depicted here, the travel time between these cities was a little under three hours uh, and the travel dis average travel distance was uh, a little under 200 miles. So kind of uh, ground truthing this with things like Google Maps uh, the kind of validates at least these baseline conditions and gives us confidence in, in moving forward that we can then kind of start to explore these disruption scenarios. And so that's kind of what we're seeing here. On the left-hand side, you can see some screen grabs of the My Hazards tool. Uh, again, that's developed by the Arizona Geological Survey. The dark blue areas show areas that have a uh, high, high likelihood of flooding, and the dark red indicate areas that have a high probability of wildfire. Um, and so the scenario that I'm about to show you, we uh, uh, look at a full network disruption at two locations along Interstate 10, one kind of at the Arizona-California border and one just east of Tucson. Um, you can see those with the in the red arrows on the map. And what we'll see here is uh, two kind of separate results. The results on the left-hand side are kind of the disruption right after the disruption occurs. You can see uh, some large looping and rerouting occurring kind of right towards the left center of the screen between Phoenix and Los Angeles and kind of a similar effect uh, between uh, around Tucson. And so overall, this disruption scenario led to increases in travel time of up to 60% for individual agents along certain routes. Uh, and then we explored a robustness scenario where you can imagine something like um, additional capacity uh, built into the road network or um, uh, uh, strengthening or hardening of, of bridges to uh, minimize their chances of being washed out by flooding. Uh, and this robustness scenario uh, ultimately leads to travel times and distances returning to their baseline levels. Um, so this is this is, as I mentioned, ongoing work, uh, and there's there's still lots to be done and lots that we're hoping to explore using this this model and kind of related analysis. We want to look at a lot more at uh, some various uh, disruption scenarios both for natural hazards, but also for things like uh, infrastructure age or, or areas that are highly prone to accidents, uh, compare different resilience strategies. We've only started to scratch the surface with that. Uh, and of course, do some sensitivity analysis to help um, dis discern the most important parameters uh, in this analysis and in this decision-making. Um, and ultimately, we kind of view this as a, as a uh, nice stepping stone in the evolution of, of kind of moving from resilience as, as the more static thinking that, that kind of is, is emblematic of the traditional approach to resilience towards this more active dynamic perspective of resilience where we're able to more proactively think about, understand and engage with uh, different resilience strategies that can hopefully be implemented before disruption happens uh, rather than us kind of having to continually respond to and rebuild after disruptions happen. Um, so thank you very much for your time and attention and uh, happy to take any questions, any uh, ideas, suggestions, interest in collaborating, uh, anything like that. So thank you very much. And um, I'll turn it back over to Rebecca. All right. Thank you. Very, very interesting talk. It's nice to see some forward looking resilience uh, modeling work going on. Um, so we do have one question uh, from Kai Lan. Could you explain a little bit more about how to model the behavior rules of agents in your agent based model and specifically how many agent categories do you have in your model? 
Yeah, so uh, right now we're kind of building up, so starting small. So we have two agent categories. There's basically passenger and freight. Um, and the different kind of factors that uh, are inputs to the, to the agent uh, behavior are essentially uh, their, where they start from and where they want to go. So the origin and destination, uh, as well as uh, the time in which they leave. And that's about it. We kind of leave it open to um, uh, the, the underlying traffic simulation model, which, which I did mention, but it, uh, Matt Sim is the um, simulation tool that we're using. So there's kind of built in and established traffic behavior conditions uh, uh, already built into it. And so we kind of uh, leave those uh, untouched and just kind of allow the agents to react and respond accordingly, especially in the initially after the disruptions. All right. Um, we had uh, one more question come in. Um, it popped up and then it went away. Could we yeah, I saw it too, and then I don't know where it went. <laughs> ah, here we go. Okay. Um, so a question from uh, Michael Craig. Nice presentation. Can you talk more about what metric you're using to quantify robustness, such as regret or something else? Yeah. Thanks, Michael. It's uh, a good question. So initially, the, the kind of the, the the two metrics we're looking at right now are just the really the the travel time and the travel distance. And we're doing that to basically compare to from the disruption scenario back to the baseline scenario. So I guess, for example, if you're looking at a robustness situation, how how close to the baseline conditions can you get from where you were at, at immediately after the disruption? Um, but moving forward, yeah, there's lots of other things we want to add to this. So I think regret would be one. Um, there's definitely like some cost implications for the particular strategies that currently isn't included here. But you know, for example, we know that adding redundancy to the route or adding lanes or adding alternate routes, I would those would fall under the robustness category. But we also know those are going to be pretty expensive. And so kind of um, ultimately we want to build in some of those cost components so that you can do more of a cost benefit type of analysis as well and and really start to compare the different resilient strategies across a variety of different uh, factors beyond just travel time or distance. Uh, those are kind of the initial starting points, but definitely not the end points. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, sounds like we'll stay tuned for more yes. exciting stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. On to our uh, next speaker. David Kiros from Colorado State University, the Mechanical Engineering Department. Welcome, David. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Looks good. All right. So, um, yeah, my name is David Kiros. I'm a PhD student at Colorado State University. I work on algae systems sustainability modeling with Dr. Jason Quinn. And today I'll be talking about the geographical and temporal evaluation of the water demand of algae-based products that we have been working on. So first I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about algae in general. So algal biomass is considered a promising feedstock for high-dense biofuels. And this is for a number of reasons. Uh, first, we get more biomass and lipids or oils per unit area than traditional energy feedstocks such as soybeans um, and rapeseed, for example. And different from terrestrial crops, you don't really need high quality land to grow algae in. Uh, as you can see here on this picture, algae is grown in, the, in these systems called op open raceway pond systems. These are basically lined ponds with a paddle wheel to mix the culture and optimize the exposure to light of the culture. So you get rid of that uh, food versus fuel debate uh, because you're not uh, taking away land that would be otherwise used for food. You can also integrate algae with uh, other technologies like carbon capture technologies and use CO2 directly from power plants or chemical processing plants and also uh, integrate it with wastewater streams. And algae, um, yeah, it's not all uh, good. It has a lot of challenges. Basically, the high cost of cultivation systems are one of the main reasons that we haven't you know, deployed this technology at scale. 
And there are really a lot of questions about the sustainability of algae biofuels uh, once we go at commercial scale. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So focusing on the water demand of large scale cultivation of algae. And there's really a lot of work to be done here. The, the, there's a lack of detailed studies and there's a large variability in results mainly for two main reasons. So before I explain the reasons, let's look at the water footprint uh, metric. Uh, this is a commonly used metric to measure water usage of a process or a product. And it's basically the ratio of water consumption to your functional unit. In this case is biomass or biofuel generated. And this is gonna vary depending on how you calculate the top and bottom part of this fraction, right? So the first source of variability is, comes from the growth modeling methodology that you use. Most studies use simple first order models or they use experimental results from one location they try to extrapolate to other locations and don't really capture, you know, really what's happening at a high resolved uh, temporal scale, like how sensitive it's to like weather parameters or temperature. And the other reason is the evaporation me modeling methodology that you use. Most studies use pan or lake evaporation measurements or empirical models that are not validated. And they don't really capture the size effects of the system. And to uh, illustrate that, that is a really important component. I have this evaporation curve here. So most of the studies in literature use uh, evaporation rates from experimental raceway ponds. And these ponds are small in size, a couple meters long. And they really are not representative of large scale systems because the paddle wheel adds uh, you know, extra turbulence, which uh, uh, increases evaporation rates. So you have more evaporative cooling, more mass transfer. So it's really hard to extrapolate if your model is not gonna capture the, the length, uh, the, the, the effect of length. So looking at all this, uh, this is our research question. What is the water intensity of commercial microalgae cultivation in open raceway systems? And how can we reduce the uncertainty in the calculation? So we first need to define, you know, water consumption for the algae system that we're looking at. Here, I'm showing you a process diagram. Um, so the biomass production process consists of two stages, uh, cultivation in open raceway pond systems shown here. Then you pull out that biomass from the ponds and it goes through a three step dewatering process where you get a biomass of 20% uh, dry. Right, so then you can convert that into pro proteins or fuels, and we use some assumptions to simplify the modeling. And applying these assumptions really uh, leaves us with the water uh, footprint metric uh, being equal to the evaporation losses over the productivity of the pond. So the um, robustness of your calculation is really going to depend on how you are modeling evaporation losses and uh, aerial productivity or biomass yields, right? So the way we do this is we use a dynamic growth model consisting of a thermal model and a biological model. The thermal model uh, takes things like weather data, the pond geometry and calculates the pond temperature and then feeds that into the biological model, which uh, considers different things that affect algae growth. And you get uh, your outputs uh, are algal concentration at a highly, uh, temporally resolved uh, resolution as, as you can see here, we can get you know hourly um, uh, outputs of pond temperature, evaporation rates, aerial productivity at a, at a really high resolution. So we validated our thermal model. Here's the uncertainty uh, of, the, of the model. And we validated this with our hourly experimental measurements for both temperature and depth. So this, this way we can ensure that we're capturing both temperature and evaporation rates uh, accurately, right? And then uh, we also validated our biological model to represent the current state of technology. This was validated with uh, experimental data from growth, co growth campaigns at the University of Arizona, uh, Arizona State University during the summer of 2019. So once we validate our, validated our models, we set a simulation framework. Um, we use thermal inputs, different. Uh, we integrated this with uh, weather data. We use two sets of 
weather data, uh, uh, historical weather data comprising of 21 years from the National Solar Radiation Database and the TMY files, kind of to compare if we can, you know, uh, simplify this modeling with TMY files without any loss of accuracy. We modeled two different facility sizes to check if we're actually capturing the effects of size in, in our model. And we set our biological inputs and then uh, we create uh, outputs and surface interpolated to represent them in these uh, heat maps shown here. So I'm gonna start with uh, evaporation results first. Uh, here you can see annual evaporation losses for the two model facilities using historical weather data. This is the annual average of the 21 uh, simulated years. Uh, so on the left, I'm showing the 400 hectare facility and on the right, the 4,000 hectare facility. And from looking at this, we can identify some regional differences. For example, evaporation losses are the highest in the Southwest region as expected due to the dry conditions there. And then the Gulf and uh, the Gulf Coast has you know, is in the middle range of the spectrum, uh, ranging from about 5 million liters per hectare per year to 9.9. .9. Um, it's more uh, humid there. And then northern latitudes, uh, you know, having the lowest evaporation rates. And if we compare the facility sizes, we can see that there's a slight reduction uh, as you increase the size of the facility to a 4,000 hectare facility while the 400 hectare facility goes to a maximum of 16.8 million liters, then if you increase the size, you go to 16.3. So results are showing that water loss at a, at a 400 hectare scale is kind of representative of a larger scale system. It's a slight reduction. And then if we compare that to, if we check the results um, that were generated with TMY3 data, we can see that uh, the same regional differences, but Results from this uh, weather data set has, um, you know, some uncertainty in it. If we check the 400 hectare maximum, this is 21.4. While if you increase the facility size, you go all the way down to 17.1 million liters. So these are more pronounced ch uh, change uh, from what we saw using actual weather data, right? So you can see that TMY already is introducing uncertainty and error into our calculation, and we also did a weather data comparison. Uh, this is comparing each of the, you know, results from actual weather data and TMY at each location for each of the facility sizes. And we can see that for the 400 hectare facility, the average error is around 15%. But if you go down to 4,000 hectare facility, the error reduces to 8%. And this can be explained by looking at the wind speed measurements. Uh, we uh, concluded that the model is highly sensitive to wind speed, so you really need accurate evaporation, uh, accurate um, high quality wind speed data for accurate evaporation modeling. And that, that's something that TMY data lacks because it was mostly, uh, you know, uh, built for solar radiation uh, calculations. So you can see that at the 4,000 hectare facility wind speed is a little less, you know, um, a little less important parameter because the facility size increases, so you have saturation over the pond, so it's, uh, you know, dominated by natural convec convection, more uh, about how much uh, water vapor is in the in the air, and less about the wind speed. So that's why your uh, kind of decreases at the 4,000 hectare facility. Then we can see aerial productivity results. We see that these uh, results are really temperature dependent. You can see that at warm temperatures, we get higher biomass yields as expected. And uh, these yields can go up to 24.8 in the Gulf Coast region in Florida. So once we have uh, aerial biomass yields and evaporation results, we can calculate our water footprint for the three different systems that we're analyzing. We're analyzing biomass, proteins, and biofuels. And you can see that the national average for biomass is around 157 cubic meters per ton of biomass. Uh, for proteins is 376, and for biofuels, 11.2 uh, cubic meters per uh, gigajoule of biodiesel. And if we compare this to other energy crops, traditional energy systems, we can see that algal biomass has a more favorable water footprint than most traditional energy crops, except for drought tolerant crops like alfalfa. Uh, this footprint was 
also calculated to be twice as lower than irrigated corn and an order of magnitude lower than soybean, for example. But it, it's important to know that we're comparing national averages here. So averages, so in some areas such as the corn belt water requirements could be lower for corn, for example. Um, if we compare the uh, protein system, we can see that algae shows a significantly smaller footprint than all other energy crops. And this is due to the high protein content of algal biomass. Um, this is two times smaller than alfalfa, which is another uh, crop with high uh, protein content. And then in terms of fuels, we can see that algal biodiesel also showed a similar footprint in other biofuels, being almost three times lower than corn ethanol. And results are demonstrated that algal biomass uh, proteins and fuels are less water intensive than products from conventional energy crops. But looking at things like petroleum fuels or petroleum diesel, uh, we can see that algae biomass is an order of magnitude uh, larger. Uh, algal biofuels is a, an order of magnitude larger than uh, petroleum diesel in terms of water consumption. And this is because, you know, conventional diesel production uh, has been around for a while. So the process is really optimized to spend less water. And uh, so in conclusion, we can see that the water footprint of algal systems was found to be more favorable when compared to conventional biomass feedstocks but higher than petroleum-based fuels. Uh, we need high temporal and spatial resolution uh, to really capture, you know, accurate uh, temperature evaporation and algae growth rates in these open raceway systems. And temperature profiles of pilot scale ponds are really not representative of commercial scale ponds because they have different evaporation rates. Therefore, uh, temperature is going to be different as well. Uh, some future work here, uh, we're looking at performing a fuel water life cycle, accounting for local water stress and expand the system boundary to model different conversion path pathways. Also trying to compare the economic and environmental implications of evaporation rates on saline cultivation versus freshwater cultivation and study the implications also of pond operation on water usage metrics. Uh, how often are you going to recycle your media? If you operate the pond in different modes, uh, is it going to save water or not? And before I open it to questions, I want to thank the Department of Energy for funding this project, our collaborators at Arizona State University, and my advisor, Dr. Jason Quinn at Colorado State, and all the uh, Quinn Lab Group. So uh, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much, David. Very interesting work. It's nice to see algae still still going strong there. Um, so we have one question in the chat um, from Kailan, uh, who says, nice nice presentation, and I agree. How would you uh, determine the water footprint if there's a portion of the wastewater coming in as the input water stream? So what I have seen in LCAs is that when they're using wastewater, they treat that as a credit, right? Because you are, uh, you know, instead of, uh, yeah, you can take it as a credit because you're giving it a service and recycling of wastewater. Um, so yeah, that's what most people do. And I don't see why it shouldn't be treated as a credit. That's a good question. Yep. And uh, kind of a follow-up for that. So um, fair warning, I know I know almost nothing about algae production except that it is quite difficult. So um, the water that you're using uh, to grow the algae, are there any are there any specific treatment requirements or purity requirements that might exacerbate uh, the energy that you have to use to purify that water? I'm thinking you might be using much less water, but how much energy do we have to use to treat it and purify it? Right. So yeah, that's a good question. So. Going back to that uh, process flow diagram uh, in that dewatering stage, there's actually a stage uh, where it's UV sterilized to minimize energy uh, in that process. So, but there are really not any requirements. I mean, you can you can use wastewater because it has a lot of nutrients, but um, except for saline cultivation, um, there's really not any requirements uh, regarding like things like salinity or pH. But it, yeah. Okay, good. 
Uh, I have a question, uh, which is that, um, so again, I also know very little about this area, but sort of sitting here, I often think about like energy questions, right? And so from the water perspective, you mentioned, for example, that, you know, petroleum is in some sense like using less than algae. So if, you, if you're like sort of communicating these results to a decision maker who's maybe trying to weigh like, you know, water considerations, energy considerations, like um, food stock consideration, sort of how would you kind of suggest that they take this into account, like as they're balancing these different um, um, considerations against each other okay yeah so yeah that's a good question because uh people often think about you know greenhouse gas emissions as the metric for comparison to other fuels but yeah we're we're seeing things like water is going to be an issue later if we don't consider this and compared to, I, I would compare it to other biomass feedstocks instead of petroleum fuels of course petroleum has been around and it's super easy to get petroleum out process it and it has it, because it has been around for a while but yeah i would say take not only greenhouse gas emissions into account but also make sure that you're comparing apples to apples because it, it's not really fair to compare petroleum and algae from a water perspective while you're doing better with algae from a greenhouse gas perspective so yeah i think the, the two of them should go hand in hand Awesome. And so actually that's the end of the time for the Q&A session. Thank right, you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's uh, bring up our next speaker who is Kai Lan, a postdoc associate researcher from the Yale School of the Environment. So is it good right now? Yep, looks good. Yes. Let's go. Okay. Hi, good morning. Good evening, everybody. So I am Kai Lan from Yale Lab, Yale University. So today I'm going to present our work in quantifying the dynamic and variabilities in life cycle carbon and energy analysis for CLT in the southeastern US. Woody biomass is one of the most abundant renewable sources and it has been used to produce bioenergy and biobasic products. In the southern US, the standing timber harvest was estimated by the USDA Forest Service to increase around 7 to 10 percentage from uh, 2015 to 2055. At the same time, the forest growth cycle is largely affected by many factors, such as management strategies and site conditions. Given the dynamic nature of forest system, understanding the environmental implications of timber products derived from woody biomass in a dynamic way is critical for decision-making process. Currently, timber products are mainly used in the construction industry, which means the industry devoted to produce building construction materials that has been one of the major sources of uh, GHG emissions and uh, energy consumption. According to IEA International Energy Agency in 2018, the global construction industry accounted 6 percentage of the total final energy consumption and 11 percentage of the CO2 emissions. As the global population grows, the GHG emissions and energy consumption of construction industry will continue increasing. At the same time, in North America, the constructural system in middle-rise and high-rise buildings largely depended on using reinforced concrete and steel. Under this situation, CLT, cross-laminated timber, has attracted increasing attention recently, especially for mid-rise and high-rise buildings. So CLT is a prefabricated mass timber product with an odd number of lumber layers, typically three, five, or seven, that are stacked crosswise, typically 90 degrees, to form a solid panel. To quantify the environmental implications of CLT system from the forest side all the way to the end of life cases, we can use LCA, life cycle assessment. However, the previous LCA studies in CLT system have some knowledge gaps. The first one is a no consideration for the uncertainty and variations of wood quality for its operations, lumber production, transportation distance, and uh, CLT production. The second one is lack of consideration for the end of life for both CLT panels and the manufacturing waste generated from the mills. The third one is lack of uh, counting these effects on a standard level basis, for example, one hectare forest length. So these 
technology gaps are mainly due to two challenges. The first one is a methodological challenge for traditional LCA, that is the process being a steady state. The second one is lack of a quantitative understanding of the relationship between the fee stock variations and the performance of the manufacturing parameters. To address these challenges, this study we developed a dynamic and the credit to grade life cycle model for manufacturing CLT from Southern Yellow Pan in the southeastern US over 100 years. For our research method in this study, the first step, the biomass production is simulated in fossil log, which is the uh, pine growth and the simulation model, which I will introduce later. The second step is building the CLT manufacturing lifecycle model, considering all the variations. And the third step, we build the cradle to grief parametric LCA model in Excel and conducted the scenario analysis and uncertainty analysis for 100 year time span. Now let's look at these steps one by one. For our system boundary, we build the cradle to grief system, including the log production, lumber production, and then CLT production, CLT construction and demolition, and finally CLT recycling. In this system, all the upstream burdens of producing fuels, power, and chemicals are included. For log production, forest growth and yield data are the fundamental data used to calculate carbon sequestration and the storage. To simulate the data, fossil lobby is used as a stand level growth and yield model developed to simulate the log lobby pan management. Then the growth and yield data are used to calculate the GHG and the energy consumption on one hectare forest basis over 100 years. And in this study, as shown in this table, we have a two varied growth cases we call the GC, based on the varied site productivity indicated by the site index. And in this study, we choose the rotation length to be 25 years. The forest uh, operations include site preparation, planting, applying fertilizer, applying herbicide, and logging. The LCI data of forest operation were collected from the literature to assess the data ranges and uh, evaluate the uh, distributions. The first step for CLT manufacturing is to produce the lumber. After logs are sent to the lumber mill, the first thing is sawing, which will generate bark, slabs, chips, and wet sawdust. Then, Wet lumber is sent to kiln for drying, as shown here. After drying, the lumber is planed, which will generate the uh, shavings, chips, and the dry sawdust. Kiln drying is a high energy, intense unit operation. Based on current literature, the four fuel sources mainly include bark, sawdust, shavings, and natural gas. In this study, Two end-of-life options for meal residues are modeled as energy recovery case and the so to market case. In energy recovery case, hog fuel including sawdust, bark, shaving chips from plenty are burned to recover the energy. If the shaving and chips are excessive, they are burned to generate power. This case represents the situation where setting the wood residue is not economically feasible for example, high transportation costs. And in the second case, in the sell to market case, the residues are sold to produce wood products and the natural gas is used for kiln drying. Then the plain and the dry lumber is sent to CLT producer. The first step, lumber preparation may include lumber selection, grouping, recording, and dust removal. Following step is longitudinal end jointing to make a parallel and the longitudinal continuous lumber. Then the lumber are layered up and applied with glue for face bonding. Due to the uneven surface by excessive reasons or hot pressing, planning or trimming is needed after pressing. Then the final step 
is called a computerized numerical control CNC cutting or can be called an cutting. In this study, it is assumed that all the wood residue generated by CLT producer are sent to landfill. Then the CLT panels are sent to construction site. After 60 years, the next step is demolition. In this study, the recycling rate is assumed due to the lack of data. So two cases of CLT envelope will be analyzed in this study. The first one is called landfilling, which means zero percentage of recycling rate. The second one is called recycling, which means 50 percentage of the recycling rate. And in this study, the GHG emissions, many refer to the methane and the CO2 by landfill decay, are estimated by using the first order decay model developed by IPCC, as shown in these two question, uh, equations. For all these scenarios, we set up eight different scenarios because we have uh, for log production, we have two different GC growth cases, and for meal residues, we have two different envelope cases for meal residues, and we have two different recycling rate cases. So in combination, totally, we have eight different scenarios. For each scenario, the Monte Carlo simulation runs 500 uh, iterations. Now let's look at uh, the results. This figure shows one hectare accumulative above ground biomass for two growth cases simulated by fossil log, along with the breakdown of the log and the residue data in the right part. So from this figure, GC2 has higher log output and higher um, residue output because the higher site productivity. After each rotation, logs on the block are transported to lumber mills and the residues are left on site. If we track the uh, dynamic carbon flows on one hectare for over 100 years, we can have this figure. Here is an example of scenario six, which means uh, GC2 with uh, energy recovery case and the 50 percentage of the recycling rate. The figure A shows all the carbon flows related to CLT, and uh, figure B shows the carbon flows related to wood waste and the byproducts, just to avoid too many overlapping lines. In this figure, the positive value means GHG emissions, and the negative value means uh, sequestered CO2. The shaded area of each line indicates the Monte Carlo simulation results where we use 50th percentile to 95th percentile. If we look at figure A, the blue dash line here means uh, above ground tree biomass, which every 25 years, we have a clear cut. Then the logs are sent to produce CLT, indicated by the uh, green solid line here. Then the biogenic carbon is stored in the CLT indicated by the green dash line here. And in year 25, year 85, there is a little decrease in the stored carbon due to the CLT demolition and the recycling. The GHG emissions by forest operations, construction, demolition, and the recycling are very minor. Then in figure B, carbon storage in the landfill waste is indicated by the black dash line here, and the emissions by landfill waste are indicated by the black solid line here. The carbon stored in online residues is indicated by the gray dash line as a marker here, and the emission by the online residue are indicated by the green solid line here. The GHG emissions by the residue are actually very significant, which further highlight the need of more efficient usage. And uh, the materials from uh, lumber production are assumed to produce durable wood products, which indicated by the yellow dash line here. If we want to compare the net life cycle GHG emissions of eight scenarios on one hectare based over 100 years, we can have a two different, uh, we can have this figure. So we have two different uh, growth cases and two different uh, 
energy uh, recovery case for the meal residue and the two different recycling rates. If we look at the figure, the largest effect comes from the site productivity. For two different uh, growth cases, GC2 scenarios have lower net GHG emissions, about 36 percentage by medium value than GC1. So the larger contribution from higher forest productivity over 100 years is highlighted. The second large effect comes from the varied few options for TM drying. Over eight scenarios, choose energy recovery case results in higher one hectare GHG emissions than choosing so to market by 11 percentage. But it, here it is noticeable that on one hectare base, choosing so to market case generates much larger fossil based GHG emissions than energy recovery case, which I will show you in the next figure. And the choosing different recycling rate slightly um, differs in the uh, results because uh, the small impact from the recycling rate in 100 years is caused by only the CLT panels from the first rotation logs are involved with the recycle. If we look at the fossil based GHG emissions of one, forest, one hectare forest line for over 100 years, things are totally different. So choosing so to market case can result in over 150% higher fossil-based GHG emissions than energy recovery case. To better compare the results with current literature, which use a cradle to gate system boundary in one cubic meter CLT basis, we also display the cradle to gate results. First, the effects of different growth cases are minor because a different GC only affect the emission in log production. Second, the alternative from using meal residue for energy recovery to sell to market case can reduce the GHG emissions by over 40%. And these results are staying in line with the literature data. To summarize, this study develops a, a, a dynamic and uh, credit to grid modeling framework and examines the carbon and energy flows of CLT life cycle over 100 years on one hectare forest land. First, higher site productivity leads to significantly lower net life cycle GHG emissions over 100 years. The largest GHG emission sources is from CLT manufacturing. Third, the wood waste decay generates a significant amount of GHG emissions over 100 years. And this work has been published in environmental research letters last year. And finally, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Yuan Yao, for all the help on this study. And we would like to thank the funding agencies for supporting this work. And thank Dr. Joshua Nifo for pro providing the feedback for this project. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Great presentation. I, uh, I always love to see people doing biomass based life cycle assessment and then just making it as complicated as biomass really is. So yeah. great work. Um, I have a question on the um, I have, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or the yeah. Q&A feature. So I'm just going to jump in. Um, I'm curious about your fast lob model for the loblolly pine growth. Yeah. Um, so you're simulating 100 years of pine growth, which is kind of the, the timeline you need to get a really good picture of you know, tree growth because it takes yeah. a while. Um, so I'm curious, uh, is there anything in that model that will allow you to simulate different effects of a change in climate? Um, actually, I I don't think fossil lobbies allow you to cooperate with uh, different climate change projections. So that model is uh, based on the forestry experimental data. So the reaction to different side index fertilizer, plant density, and the uh, management strategies. Yeah. And then they do the regression and they allow the simulation. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It'd be nice to have a, a like a descent like model for tree growth, but I know that's, you know, that's a whole PhD project in and of itself. <laughs> Um, I'll pause for a second. Uh, last call for any more questions uh, from the chat or the Q&A feature or indeed from Priya. Well, hearing none, uh, let's move on to our final speaker. So thank you very much, Kai.
Uh, and our next speaker is Tirwork Tibebu, who is a third year PhD student at Golisano Institute for Sustainability at Rochester Institute of Technology. Welcome. All right, is that? Yes. We have it. Great. Let me just mute myself. And let me know basically when you want me to advance and take it away. Okay, thank you. And okay, thank you. Um, my name is Tarork. I apologize for the technical issues. Um, I will be discussing about roles of diffusion patterns and environmental benefits in determining renewable subsidies. And uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the National Science Foundation for uh, supporting this work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Clean energy technologies are essential to um, address environmental emissions and governments have implemented um, various policies such as uh, subsidies to support these technologies. Uh, but subsidizing renewable energy technologies uh, requires substantial public spending. Um, therefore, it is important to implement efficient subsidy schedule that maximize the long-term net benefits to society. Uh, there are two main conceptual arguments uh, for justifying subsidy of clean uh, technologies. Uh, one is the direct environmental benefits, and uh, the second one is the indirect technological benefits. The direct environmental benefits um, is um, the benefits in the form of reduced emissions, and the indirect benefits uh, uh, is a benefit in a form that stimulates uh, market and cost reduction for new technologies. So uh, these two conceptual arguments are important to justify clean energy subsidies, uh, but they are incomplete on their own. Uh, therefore, assessment of uh, clean energy subsidies uh, needs to account for both the direct and indirect benefits. Uh, an important uh, factor that is common uh, to both these conceptual arguments is uh, the policy-induced adoption. Uh, in order to estimate uh, the subsidies direct environmental benefits, uh, it requires a projection of policy-induced adoption of the technology and uh, reduced emissions resulting from uh, that adoption. And also, uh, in order to account for the longer-term technological progress benefits, uh, it needs to estimate how induced adoption pushes the technology down its learning curve and uh, thereby accelerate, accelerate broader adoption in the future. Uh, so technology adoption is central to understanding both uh, the direct uh, environmental benefits and the indirect technological progress benefits resulting from the subsidy. Uh, in this research, we combine these ideas and our objective is to analyze the role of environmental benefits, technological progress and adoption patterns in determining long term subsidy support design for clean energy technologies. And in order to do this, we uh, follow three steps. Uh, first, we apply techno economic framework to estimate optimal subsidy schedule for uh, two clean uh, technologies, which are residential solar PV and uh, utility scale wind. Uh, second, we show the difference in both the quantitative and qualitative outcomes uh, when applying uh, this framework. And third, we develop a simpler approach to analyze and understand these differences. So first, let's start uh, with the integrated techno-economic model that is used to analyze optimal subsidy schedule for uh, clean uh, energy technologies. Uh, the model, which we call here a full techno-economic model, uh, is adapted from our previous study. It uh, basically integrates uh, three, uh, in three independent models, uh, adoption model, technological progress model, and uh, benefit cost models. The adoption model determines the diffusion rate of uh, the technology resulting from a given subsidy level and uses the net present value uh, as an explanatory variable. The technological progress uh, model applies a one-factor experience curve 
to forecast technology cost reduction. And the benefit cost model is based on an emissions, emissions assessment uh, framework uh, that analyzes the effect of environmental emissions reduction uh, resulting from adoption of clean uh, technology that clean um, technology. It uses um, the avoided emissions. Uh, it estimates the avoided emissions from uh, using social cost of carbon and marginal damage factors from criteria pollutants. So uh, the model uh, in general uses a non-linear optimization uh, with the objective of maximizing the national net benefit, which is defined as the monetized emission benefits minus the subsidy cost. And using this model, we can come up with an optimal subsidy schedule, which look, looks like the figure you have there on the left uh, that maximizes the national net benefit. So we applied this model for US electricity system uh, divided across 13 regions and determined an optimal subsidy uh, that is fixed uh, across these regions. On uh, the left side, we have the optimal subsidy schedule for utility scale wind. And on the right side, we have uh, the schedule for residential solar PV. So from these two figures, we can see that uh, the results are qualitatively different from one another. The optimal subsidy for utility scale wind relatively stays approximately uh, the same over the years, uh, whereas the incentive for residential solar is declining. We uh, also evaluated the optimal subsidy schedule that can be varied across these regions depending on their energy grid mix, uh, resource potential, and economic parameters. And we observed again the same difference between uh, these two technologies. So the question we want to ask uh, in this uh, research is, uh, why is, why the, is why the optimal subsidy relatively stays the same for utility wind, uh, whereas it is declining for residential solar PV. So in order to uh, answer this, we find it difficult to explain this difference using the full techno-economic model uh, due to its complex nature. The full model constitutes uh, three independent models interlinked to one another. The subsidy affects the adoption through both short and long-term technology cost reduction. Hence, um, the adoption and the technology progress models cannot be easily isolated. Therefore, uh, um, we, as a result, we introduced a simpler approach uh, called a restricted model in order to isolate the three models uh, and explain that difference. So uh, we build a model which follows a simpler approach than the full technology techno-economic model, uh, so that instead of using um, non-linear optimization, it allows us to solve the optimal subsidy with a simple algebraic equation. The restricted model assumes that the adoption curve as a function of the subsidy follows a simple exponential curve, uh, which is shown here in equation one. Here, uh, the exponential term A1 is uh, defined as the elasticity of diffusion or uh, the amount of stimulated adoption per subsidy expenditure. The restricted model is also simplified in such a way that it uh, limits the effect of technological progress and learning. So using the adoption model shown above um, and solving for the optimal subsidy, we get that the optimal subsidy is given by uh, the benefits minus one over elasticity of diffusion. So this uh, solution defines a mathematical condition for when to subsidize the technology. For a clean energy technology with um, an adoption curve as defined here, the criteria to subsidize the technology is satisfied when the value of B is greater than one over A1. So this criteria implies that 
to continue subsidizing a given technology at the current price, the environmental social benefits should be greater than the subsidy expenditure per stimulated adoption. So when looking at the results of the restricted model, the optimal subsidy uh, level determined by using the analytical solution of the restricted model consists two main factor, factors. The environmental benefits and uh, the environmental benefits shown here on the x-axis and the elasticity of diffusion, which is shown on the y-axis. The break-even line for subsidizing a technology is shown here by uh, the green line. So if the coordinates of uh, B and A1 uh, is above, the, above this line, the technology should be subsidized. And if it is below this line, then it should not be subsidized. So this figure shows the coordinates. Um, the points you see here shows the coordinates of the values of B and A1. Uh, for rooftop solar and utility scale wind power in the 13 different regions we considered. So as seen in this figure, we wind technologies tend to have a higher value of B and A1 than rooftop solar and uh, are found on the subsidized side of the region. Uh, when estimating the value of uh, the benefit in a particular region, uh, the marginal emission benefits are kept constant for both technologies, but the capacity factor of the two technologies is different. Uh, therefore, uh, wind, uh, sin uh, since wind has um, a relatively wind technology has a relatively higher uh, capacity factor than solar PV, the monetized environmental emission reduction benefits per megawatt of adoption is higher for wind than solar PV. Uh, in addition to this, the adoption curve for wind technology is determined to be steeper than solar, implying that the stimulated adoption per subsidy expenditure in a given region is higher for wind than solar PV. So uh, the optimal subsidy, um, the optimal subsidy is above the break-even line uh, for wind in all the ISO regions. Meanwhile, um, the optimal subsidy for rooftop solar lies uh, below the break-even line for nine ISO regions out of the 13. Next slide, please. Uh, so from uh, this research, we can see that both direct and indirect technological uh, progress models, uh, uh, in technological progress benefits, uh, should be accounted when analyzing clean energy uh, subsidies. Uh, if the indirect technology progress benefit is not accounted, uh, that is, if there is no tech, tech progress, then uh, the results show that solar technologies um, in most regions should not be subsidized. Also, uh, diffusion of a technology plays an important role in the degree to which subsidies are uh, justifiable. Uh, wind subsidies are justified due to a combination of both higher environmental benefits and higher elasticity of diffusion as a function of the subsidy level. Uh, hence, uh, studies should design and apply adoption models more care carefully when uh, analyzing clean energy policies. Uh, and with this, I will end my presentation. Thank you for your time. Um, I, uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or via the Q&A. Um, I, I don't want to be the one asking the first question all the time. So Priya, do you have any questions? Yeah, I guess a high level question is, um, so you mentioned like the full techno-economic model is just like way too complicated to analyze. And you sort of then said, let's create the simplified model. And I guess I'm curious to hear a little bit more about what is the relationship between the economic model and the simple one? Are there ways in which you think maybe the simplified model would give slightly different results or make slightly different assumptions than the full model? Um, yeah, I mean, as much as possible, we tried to keep the simplified model or what we call the restricted model uh, to be as similar uh, as we can to the uh, main or the full techno-economic model. So that uh, the only thing we want to uh, um, 
get from the restricted model is that we want to solve the model algebraically using mathematical equations to see uh, how the optimal subsidy is driven for a given technology because uh, we were not able to do that for the using the full technical model because it is uh, it uses a nonlinear uh, optimization uh, which solves uh, the solution numerically using um, an excel solver software so yeah that was our main reason awesome thank you um, and it looks like there is an audience question that was asking if there's a full paper available or a written paper available where folks can check out the actual, the more of the details of the of the modeling. Sure. Um, the full techno-economic model, uh, I have a paper. I can share the, um, the link here uh, for the full techno-economic pa uh, paper. We applied uh, the full techno-economic model for only residential solars and we analyzed residential solar PV in that paper. Uh, but this one, like the comparison between wind and uh, um, solar PV is an ongoing project. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'll put out a last call. And if there is nothing, then we can adjourn. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll see through the technical difficulties, but at least it only happened once, right? Um, thank you all so much for sticking around to the very, very end of the conference, and I look forward to seeing uh, most or all of you at our IEEE happy hour uh, sometime next week. All right. Thanks all, and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone.